Hi, I'm Leo Williams from Aerodyne Research, and I'm going to tell you about my poster on detecting non-refractory particulate matter using the dual vaporizer configuration of the soot particle aerosol mass spectrometer. First, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Anita Avery, Art Sedlicek, and Tim Onash. And if you have any questions about this poster, I will be available in the chat on Monday from 6 to 7.30 p.m. So the SPAMS incorporates a N64 nanometer laser into the vaporization and ionization region of an aerosol mass spectrometer. This allows us to detect material that absorbs the 1064 nanometers, such as black carbon and metals, and the associated coatings. Typically, we run the SPAMS in one of two ways. In the laser-only mode, we remove the tungsten vaporizer, and so we're detecting only particles that have black carbon in them and the associated non-refractory coatings. In the dual vaporizer mode, which is more common, we turn the laser on and off. So with laser off, it's the same as a regular AMS with only the tungsten vaporizer. But with laser on, you get some signal from the laser vaporizer, so particles with black carbon in them, and you get some signal from the tungsten vaporizer. And the combination of the two vaporizers um, leads to uh, some confusing signals. So um, this is an example of typical ambient uh, data. This is from a field campaign in the UK in 2012. And what you can see is that the measurement with the laser on is much larger than the measurement with the laser off. So if the particles were just detected either in the laser or on the tungsten vaporizer, you would expect this to have a slope of about one. But these very large slopes um, suggest that something is going on when we turn the laser on that's not just detecting black carbon containing particles. So one of the explanations that we had was that we know when we turn the laser on, sometimes that heats up internal components of the AMS, in particular the ion chamber. And if that's hotter, it might be vaporizing um, particles that, for example, bounce off the tungsten vaporizer and leading to an increase in signal. So we just recently completed a set of experiments on that, and it turns out it's a very minor effect, um, and that um, those results will be in as &T very shortly. The other possibility is that there are differences in collection efficiency um, between the laser and the tungsten vaporizer, and also potentially differences in relative ionization efficiency. So in the laser, we know that the collection efficiency is primarily determined by the overlap of the particle beam and the laser beam. And in the, on the tungsten vaporizer, we know that the collection efficiency is primarily determined by the number of particles that bounce off the vaporizer and are not detected at all. So these two different collection efficiencies are different in the two different vaporizers and could have different dependences on particle size and shape and coating amount. We also suspect that there are differences in the relative ionization efficiency between the two vaporizers. So in the laser vaporizer, material is vaporized in the center of the ion chamber, and it's possible that that is ionized more efficiently than material that comes off the tungsten vaporizer. It's also the case that the material that comes off in the laser vaporizer is possibly at a slightly lower temperature, um, and that could also lead to more, effect, more efficient ionization, and it does lead to a different, um, less fragmented mass spectrum. Um, so that's what this experiment is focused on. So the actual experiment, um, we atomized aqueous mixtures of cabojet, which is a black carbon um, standard. We use cabojet because the particles are spherical. They're not as um, aspherical as some of the other black carbon standards, so they focus into a better particle beam, a narrower particle beam. And then we mixed that with ammonium nitrate or ammonium sulfate or levoglucosin. And we varied the ratios in these aqueous mixtures uh, by mass from 9 to 1 black carbon to non-refractory material all the way up to 1 to 9. So we wanted to cover a range of possible coating thicknesses. We dry the particles. We select with a DMA. Um, we used 300, 350, and 400 nanometer sizes. Um, it's a fairly small size range, but we needed particles that we can detect with all the different instruments. We then measured these particles with a quadrupole aerosol mass spectrometer, um, which is very good for measuring bounce. Because the quadrupole sits on a single M over Z, it actually can detect fairly small amounts of material. Um, and so we compare the number of particles that we count with the mass spectrometer to the number that we count with a CPC, and that gives us a measure of the bounce. We had an SPAMS to measure the laser on to laser off ratios. 
And then we had an SP2 uh, that we borrowed from Brookhaven National Labs um, to give us some information about the mixing state of the particles and also potentially the coating thickness. So the mixing state, we wanted to know that all particles had both black carbon and non-refractory material in them. And then coating thickness, of course, um, will be important for understanding what's going on. So here are the results for the quadrupole AMS bounce measurements. On the y-axis, I have mass spec counts over CPC. So this is a measure of bounce, uh, where zero would mean all the particles bounce, we don't see any, and one would mean we detect all of the particles with both the mass spectrometer and the CPC. On the x-axis, we have the ratio of the non-refractory material to the black carbon. Again, this is from the mass ratio in solution. Um, and you can see that as you put more and more material on the particles, they bounce less and less. Um, for the SPAMS laser on to laser off, um, that's plotted on the y-axis here. The x-axis is the same ratio of non-refractory to black carbon. And here we have the opposite trend. So the thinly coated particles have really high ratios of laser on to laser off. And the more coating you get on the particles, the closer the ratio of laser on to laser off, or the lower the ratio of laser on to laser off. So this is consistent with the bounce measurements that I showed on the previous slide. So when you have very thin coatings, a lot of the particles bounce and are not detected with the laser off mode. So this um, decreases the denominator and increases this ratio. When we get up here, most of the particles are not bouncing. So they're detected with both the laser and the tungsten vaporizer. So the laser and laser on and the tungsten vaporizer and laser off. This ratio is still larger than one, which suggests that the relative ionization efficiency is higher in the laser than on the tungsten vaporizer. Um, so we've developed a model um, to explain this. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but the basic point is that uh, when you have very thin coatings and you have a lot of bounce on the tungsten vaporizer, that decreases what you measure at the tungsten vaporizer, so your laser on to laser off ratio gets much higher. So how does this apply to ambient measurements? So this is data from this um, campaign in the UK in 2012. So for the first three weeks we ran with dual vaporizer mode. The thick line is laser on minus laser off, and the thin line is a co-located uh, AMS. On the right-hand side of this red line, uh, we took out the tungsten vaporizer, and so we were looking um, with only the laser vaporizer. In this case, we're only measuring particles that have black carbon in them uh, and the associated coatings. The thick line is what the SPAMS saw, the laser only, and the thin line is again the co-located AMS. Um, and so you can see across this whole campaign, the black carbon concentration was fairly constant. The mass loading with the other AMS was fairly constant. Um, but on the left, the dual vaporizer, laser on minus laser off, is actually quite a bit higher than the laser only measurements. And again, this is because when we have the laser off, some of these particles bounce. So if we look at the ratio of the total non-refractory PM to black carbon as a function of the black carbon coating, we can see that there's a trend where the more black carbon we have, the thinner the coatings. Um, so this might be consistent with, for example, these really high black carbon measurements are vehicle emissions, which we know don't have a lot of coating on the black carbon particles. Um, but the average ratio here of an RPM to RBC is about 2.7. So this is the laser vaporizer only data. If we then go back and look at the dual vaporizer um, ratio of laser on to laser off versus black carbon, we can see that there is an increase in that ratio as the black carbon increases, which we think is associated with thinner coatings. So this would be consistent with the laboratory experiments where as the coatings get thinner, you get more bounce of the particles um, and you decrease the laser off measurement relative to the laser on measurement. The ratio of uh, NRPM to RBC on the previous slide was 2.7, which suggests a laser on to laser off of about 2 based on our lab experiments. This is obviously much lower than that, but not all ambient particles contain black carbon. So this effect of laser on to laser off ratio is only going to be due to the black carbon containing particles. 
So the conclusions are, um, we think that we have an explanation for why the laser on signal is so much larger than the laser off signal. And it's because the two vaporizers have different collection efficiencies that vary differently with coating thickness. In addition, the laser and the tungsten vaporizers have different relative ionization efficiencies. So the real question is, can we extract information uh, from laser on, laser off data about the NRPM that's associated with black carbon? Because what we really want to understand is how do those coatings affect the optical properties of the black carbon? Um, so one question is, can we get at coating thickness, like how much stuff is on the black carbon particles? Possibly, um, we have to think about that model. There are a lot of variables in it, um, uh, so we're working on that. The other question is, can we get at the composition of the coating? And here, um, PMF does help because the mass spectra are slightly different between the two vaporizers due to the different temperatures of vaporization. So these are things that we are still working on in quantifying ambient data, but we think we have laboratory results that suggest an explanation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, please join the chat on Monday evening at 6 to 7.30 p.m. Thank you.